There we go. All right. So <laughs> welcome to the miracle of flight. Let's start over. We're going to talk about birds tonight and how they fly. It's really amazing how they're able to do that. We have big feathers here, of course. So I can, don't, this is so big I can't even get it on the screen. This is an eagle feather, and uh, you can see the camber on it. That's the curve underneath the feather that gives them that lift. And um, th these feathers are actually amazing. We're going to talk a little bit more about feathers in just a moment. And then here we have a hummingbird nest. So you can see that that little hole right here in that nest is where those babies are hatched out and uh, grow as baby hummingbirds. And compare that to a, an eagle feather, and you get some degree as to how big and how sm small feathers can actually be. Um, there was a, a gentleman back in the 1700s. His name was Bernoulli. And he created a principle of flight. And what Bernoulli's principle was is that as air crosses over a curved surface, like over the feather, it uh, creates a low pressure system, especially if the air is traveling quickly over the feather. And that creates a low pressure system. That and the, and the, um, the pressure created underneath the wing, underneath the flat surface, uh, creates lift. Well, there are different feathers that do that, and one of the feathers is the flight feather, which is the second feather that you see here. And this is an eagle flight feather. So you can see that it's, um, it's notched, as a matter of fact, because these feathers are like fingers, and they are splayed at the end to give the wing greater lift and stability. Um, the feathers also have these things called barbs and hooks. And... Um, they work in such a way that they keep the feather together. So if you took a feather and you actually spread it apart, you can actually feel and hear those barbs letting go. And um, they, they keep the feather stable and able to do the flight that, it, that um, it needs to. Okay, well, there are exceptions to this. The owl feather is created a little bit differently in the sense that at the leading edge of the feather there's these little jagged edges that make it in fact I think yes you can see here this is the leading edge of an owl feather and it helps to absorb the sound but it's so much better than that I'm going to show you some electron microscope uh, pictures here in just a moment that that demonstrate how these feathers actually absorb the sound but right now I'm going to play you a video that uh, will show you just how silent these uh, owls actually are. The bird's challenge to fly over a series of super sensitive microphones. Good girl. Oh, she's. Mo. And now, it's Kenza's turn. No, nothing at all. Absolutely quiet. It's amazing. But what have the microphones picked up? The decibel waveforms show the sound being generated by the birds in flight. Each spike is an individual wing beat. With the barn owl, there's almost nothing. Okay, so you can see from that that the um, the the feather structure of an owl's feathers are such that they just they just soak up the sound, and the reason being is that the the feathers are, are 
like a wheat field that's been blown down in a strong wind. If you look at this, this is a barn owl feather under an electron microscope, and you can see how this feather is just, uh, it's, it's like grass growing, and the sound is absorbed in all of this stuff on the front. But if you look at the feather uh, just from, uh, from a normal point of view like this, it looks kind of silky, but it's, um, but it's, it's all of this here minutia on the top of the feather that really soaks it up. If we look at a uh, falcon feather under the same microscope, you can see the divots in the feather here. That's kind of these uh, waves. And if you've ever played golf before, you know that that golf ball has um, uh, little dimples in it. And without those dimples, the golf ball wouldn't go near as far or as fast, as a matter of fact. And strangely enough, a peregrine falcon's feathers have those same uh, dimples in it uh, that a golf ball has and allows them to fly a little bit faster. If we look at these feathers up close, you can see those hooks and the barbs that they, the hooks grab onto to keep that feather together. And that's what allows this feather to hold together rather than being apart like so. So it's uh, those hooks and barbs play an important part. Now, if we look at the the structure of the feather itself, it's kind of honeycombed, and that gives the feather uh, structure within the stem of the feather itself, and uh, and makes it very very strong, and in some cases very rigid, as in the case of um, falcon feathers. Now, if we look at the feathers themselves, you have the flight feathers. These are the primaries. There's usually about 10 primary feathers. And then secondary feathers closer to the body. And then what we call covert feathers. These covert feathers add strength to the flight and secondary feathers. And then these little feathers up here at the top called Alula feathers. Now, these are really important. They don't look too significant, but they're the ones that are colored yellow here. Those Alula feathers are like slats on a jet end, uh, jet airplane. Uh, when the bird is flying slow at takeoff or landing, those Alula feathers extend themselves and add stability to the wing in slow flight so the wing doesn't stall. And the way it does that is it forces the air over and under the fed, those Alula feathers and uh, allows the air to, or forces the air to flow even faster, even when the bird is flying slower. If we look at uh, this picture here, uh, you can see those notched feathers that we were talking about earlier. This is the eagle feather that is uh, has that notch in it. And you can see those notches here in a red-tailed hawk that they kind of do the same thing. You know, if you're in a jet airplane and you look at the end of the wings, they have those canard wings that, that kind of, uh, let me see, yeah, they go like this. How do you do? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Working backwards here on the picture. But the end of the wing has this canard that adds stability to the wing in slow flight. And you can see that these feathers here, they would bend in slow flight just like that. Okay. If you have any questions that you would like to ask, please feel free to put it on the chat line and at the bottom here of the page, and uh, we'll endeavor to answer those for you as well. If we compare a bird's wing to a human arm, they have the same type of bone structure as what we do. They have a radius and an ulna and a humerus. And the way I remember that is R for radius, U for ulna, R U humerus. <laughs> Get it? Okay, R U humerus. And the birds have the same structure. They have a humerus and a radius and an ulna. And we have that same structure. When it gets to the wrist, it's different. Birds have what we call a manis. And those alula feathers we were just talking about a moment ago are attached right to the bone here on this little thumb projection right there. All right, well, bats are even a little bit different. Bats have a, um, uh, a, a structure where their fingers are able to control the surface of the patagium skin on the bat so they can do wicked things in flight. They can turn on a dime where a bird oftentimes can't do that and they can control that through these uh, finger-like projections at the uh, end of the wing. But they also have a humerus and a radius and an ulna, but like us, they have fingers in that patagium. They're mammals, as a matter of fact, and so they're kind of built just like we are in a lot of ways. Back uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a, a snowy owl that came to Salt Haven, 
and he had the misfortune of being stuck on a um, on an insulator wire up on a telephone pole and what had happened was that it was raining really hard that night and because the electricity was passing through these wires and every time his wing touched the pole here because it was wet he ended up grounding himself and uh, had uh, 16,000 volts of electricity passed through his body on a number of occasions it was uh, pretty bad uh, we did an operation on him to close his wounds he had a big hole in his leg and in his side and that operation was a success. However, because that one wing on that side was weak, he was breaking feathers. And so we had to imp feathers, implant new feathers. And what, the way we did that was we uh, put a shaft, uh, right, uh, a wooden shaft into the feather, and we drilled out the existing feather, and then inserted that wood shaft into the old feather. It's called imping. And that gave him new feathers so that he could be released earlier rather than having to wait until those feathers molted out in the spring. Okay, well, let's get back to flight again. There's four forces of flight that birds use. One is uh, lift, and, and, and the lift, if, on, if we look at a jet aircraft, their wings are very thin because the air travels over those wings very, very quickly, and that creates the lift that it needs. So we have lift. We also have weight which is uh, part of all of that. And then we have thrust and drag, the thrust created by the engines or by the propeller, and drag, of course, created by the surfaces of the plane. Well, birds recognize all of that, and the amazing thing about it is, is that they can feel with their feathers um, just what is happening because they have these little uh, uh, nerve endings in the shaft of, at, on the surface of the shaft of the feather. So when the feathers are turning, the bird can feel that, and he knows when the wing is about to stall and can make adjustments for it. If we look at these Canada geese that are landing here, these are first-time flyers, and they're a little bit awkward about it, but you can see that they're using their feet uh, as air brakes and as stabilizers. And this goose here is actually what we call spilling air. Pilots do that all the time when they're landing. If they're too high on their approach, they'll They'll dip one wing and spill some air. And that's, this goose is doing that intuitively on his first flight. This bird here, um, first of all, yeah, that's that bird there. And this, this bird down here is, uh, he's got all the stops out. He's, he's got his, his uh, body right into the wind. His wings are, are spread and tucked in tight so that he can uh, drop as much uh, uh, altitude as he can. And then when they land, uh, the air is flowing over the, the, the laminar airflow. You can see the camber here on the wing. That's that curve, and that's creating as much drag as possible, but also creating as much lift. Because if you remember Bernoulli's principle, air flowing over a, a curved surface quickly uh, creates lift. But what's happening here, just before he touches down, see he's got his air brakes out, being his feet, and laminar air surface here is being disturbed, and these feathers are ruffling, and he feels that. But now he's only a couple, about a foot off the ground, so that's okay if that wing stalls because he wants to land at his slowest possible speed. All right, well, let's go back to bats for a minute because bats are pretty amazing when it comes to flight. They can do things in the air that normal birds can't. Um, they, uh, in fact, bats have this um, ability, the females, to actually nurse their babies that are holding on to them while they're hunting and catching bugs at night in flight. It's pretty amazing. So their capacity to fly even with heavy wing loading is really incredible. And you can see these finger-like projections that we're talking about here. These bats are able to turn on a dime, as I say. Uh, they can go up or down very quickly. Uh, because they can manipulate that wing to a larger degree than, say, a, a, a bird can, because the bird has a different bone structure altogether from what uh, a bat does. All right. Well, that just about concludes our, our webinar. Uh, we'd like to encourage you.